to another exciting episode of the Limitless Mind podcast. We are your hosts, Travis Magus and Apollo Sol. Welcome back, dear listeners. Today, we're going to be covering the splendid topic of the importance of being the bigger person in the situation and not simply just being the bigger man emotionally or bigger woman mentally, but in understanding the dynamic of how to effectively manage a situation. Yeah. Oftentimes in an argument, you know, between family members, friends, or in a relationship, it's always about who's right and who's wrong. And it's always about convincing the other person, you know, that your views are right or that your feelings are valid. Um, And it seems to be a never ending battle, right? But what if all conflict could be easily avoided just by understanding how the other person feels? Very key, just by understanding the other person. And I want to clarify that doesn't even mean that the other person is right or that you're wrong. It's that's that's the thing about being a bigger person. It it's no longer about being right or wrong. At this point it becomes about how to have a resolution that is the most effective resolution. And there's no right or wrong either. It's all perspective. There's no right or wrong. To even be able to come to that level it takes a certain uh, sense of maturity because most individuals who are immature and it, it, when I say mature, I mean the development of their emotional state and their mental state isn't whole and isn't balanced, right? It's, it's always missing attention and intimacy and love. So they're going to constantly strive to grasp and steal that attention and love however they can. So with that type of mindset of an immature individual, they're going to fight to be right, even no matter what the cost. Exactly. Um, And just by knowing a few little key bits of information and knowing how to observe and analyze people and look beyond the words that you're saying, you'll start to see patterns in terms of how that person operates, right? Just how a computer has an operating system. Every person has their own individual system too, uh, whether that's, you know, the operating from the visual or from feelings. And in terms of the experiences that they go through, right? Keeping that in mind, everything shapes that person to be the way they are. So again, instead of focusing on the surface and fighting about who's right and who's wrong, you can start to be more understanding because you know that there's more deeper layers to what this person is feeling, right? It's not just what's going on in the surface. It's something that, you know, for most of us is a baggage that's carried on for years and years and years. And because we don't know how to resolve it in a healthy, emotional way, heck, we might not even be aware of it. And that translates into, you know, every relationship that you have with every person in your life. Yeah, very key. And I think that's a good point to understand that this is about layers. This isn't just about the surface level. Because what's on the surface many, many, many times is not the full situation. Not the full situation at all. So for someone to even be upset enough to want to have some type of argument or battle, that indicates that there's a lot more going on than just what's being talked about in the moment. Yeah. And again... It all goes down to the way you were raised. Isn't there like a saying or was it a a study? I can't remember, but it was something like men choose their mothers, um, like in terms of when they, when they look for a partner and then women do that with, with guys. So they, they automatically subconsciously look for the, the traits they found in their parents, whether that's good or bad. Right. And that they're just drawn to that and they find that in their partners. Very curious how that happens. How men seek their mothers and women seek their fathers. I mean, heck, with all the uh, mommy milker memes circling the internet, you know, a lot of people have a mother issues for sure. Mommy milker memes. I'm just trying to find the source and come across an article that states two thirds of men choose partners like their mothers, according to a study. Isn't that something? That's a large number. And I can already hear people listening like, oh, I don't do that. I don't look for my father. I don't look for my mother. But the thing is, this is 
it's unconscious. And I bet if you take a minute to analyze the type of personality traits that you find attractive, you probably have some of those same traits in your parents. Yeah, looking at a study, um, I can't remember exactly who said it, but a study by a dating site found that 64% of men go for women with the same personality traits as their mothers. Wow. But you know what? Like as I as I Google to find um, that info, there's a lot of articles where it's like three reasons a husband should love his wife more than he loves his mother, or who should come first, your wife or your mother? And it's like my husband lets his family disrespect me and always chooses his mother over us. So this seems to be a um, reoccurring popular issue in society, um, which is quite interesting. Again, unresolved traumas, heavy baggage very much trauma and baggage because like when i hear that i'm just thinking to myself this scenario shouldn't even be popping up like there shouldn't be a scenario where i have to choose like that that in itself i mean it shouldn't even be in the same category right it, it just sounds unhealthy it's quite interesting because once you apply these techniques to yourself um and you evolve and you do truly become a better person um and a lot more calm and a lot more orientated um to other emotional people, like it's kind of like a blow in the face right there. They're almost not happy that you're so calm and collected um, in an argument. And I've heard the one liner like, "Do you not even care? Like, are you? Why are you not as, as pissed as I am?" And it's like, well, I just I just don't see it in that way. Like, the, I'm I'm looking past the emotions, and there's there's really no need for the situation to even exist, right? But everything for the vast majority of people is very emotionally driven. So it's very hard to snap out of that trance. Yeah, I mean, no, you're on a roll. You you can't go back because you've seen too much. And it would almost be like self disrespect to, to pretend that things haven't changed, you know, based on what you've seen. So what, what what's, why do you think people do that? We, I mean, we know it's unconscious. But why do you think that people behave in that way? What's going on in their minds? Um, I'd say definitely past experiences, right? Because in general, we are shaped from our experiences. And in particular, the mind operates by observing patterns, right? Whether we are aware of it or not. Um, and, you know, if you had a previous situation that was kind of similar to the existing argument, if you will, your mind would have already learned how to respond and to react, and you're going to carry those traits over in the future. But most of the time, arguments and the deeper issues are never, you know, really resolved. The emotions explode, you know, um, the situation eventually dies down, and then it's just kind of forgotten about and you move on. But the deeper issues, you know, at least from my perspective, are never really truly resolved. So, in a way, every argument, every situation, every bad or poor communication in the future is kind of like a cry for help, right? Because if those, if those deeper issues exist, um, at some point the subconscious will bring them to the forefront of your mind and will be like, hey, you know, this happened and we need to deal with it. This needs to be resolved. But most people don't understand. They're like, oh, I just remembered like a really sad memory and, you know, now, now I'm sad. And, you know, they try and brush it aside again and it just continues and it happens. So in a way, it's kind of like, a cry for help, right? Because nobody wants to feel that way. Nobody wants to feel sad or unhappy or miserable in relationships or about themselves. So it's 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 a continuation of unresolved behavior patterns. Every situation becomes a cry for help. And you know, when you see it from that angle, it's kind of, it makes it a little bit more difficult to be personally offended, you know? Absolutely, because you see that it's nothing personal and the other person just isn't in alignment with your point of view and that's okay. Um, and it's quite interesting to see, you know, the typical relationship dynamics anyway, um, uh, through mainstream media and through spirituality, because the woman is often portrayed, you know, as emotional. Um, there's a lot of depth, very emotionally driven, symbolized by water. Right. And the guy is often, uh, you know, calm and collected, but can sometimes, you know, react with explosive anger, which is represented by fire. And once, at least from my experience, you learn to go past um, 
those labels and you know those those symbols if you will you do truly find that in a piece to you know to the point like i said previously that it does completely change your interactions with other people and they completely notice it um and in a way they try and kind of bring you back down to that emotional level it doesn't necessarily need to be antagonistic from you know their side but it, it's kind of like a, a mind-blowing thing because how many people can respond and react in that way that isn't you know fueled by emotions my mind knows the way this existence operates it's abundance why the hell would i even want to focus on the lack why the hell would i even you know think of all the worst possibilities but the other people just don't quite see it that way and if they just knew the very very basics uh, the very basic laws of this existence, life would be completely different in the first place. Because we know that everything is in abundance, right? We know that everything is created. Creation is complete. Every possibility exists and the past, the future and the present all exist simultaneously as well. There's even, you know, very, very plausible right. theories of um, multi-dimensions all existing at the same time like re realities stacked up on each other where objects can exist all at the same time in each reality and that doesn't just work for manifesting you know objects your cars money it's for people as well because it's off the same thing it all comes from the same thing and i remember this meme and I, I saved it because I was like, when I when I listened to it for the first time, it was absolutely mind blown. It was this dude and he, you know, put an alien filter on, like it was himself, his human self, talking to the alien. And the alien was like, so, you know, you're saying marriage is two humans promising each other to be together forever. And the human was like, yeah, like, don't, don't you have romantic relationships on your planet? And the alien was like, of course we do, but we don't promise you know each other to be together in the future because we know that con the connection to each other is based on your current energetical state right and it is a law in the universe that energy is always shifting and moving so no one knows if the energy between the two people will match in the future and sometimes you know the energy of both parties grows in the same direction and that's when you see the really successful relationships mm. um and sometimes it doesn't and that's okay and there's no there's no need to you know feel sad or feel bad or latch onto something that isn't working and trying to trying to fix it because the universe is based on abundance that is the natural base um, vibration of it, if you will. And as long as we humans are detached and, you know, we're, we're focusing and we're envisioning the outcome that we want and we're living in, in that moment, we will always have somebody that is more aligned with us. Hmm. So are you saying that quite possibly the way that we look at relationships could use some improvement? I think it would be beneficial to change perspectives and not be as emotionally attached to everything and then life would be a lot simpler yeah the bible says uh be not unequally yoked right that's like a famous famous quote second corinthians six fourteen, and that's basically the same premise we talk about a yoke so back in the day you know like when the bible was written they didn't have trucks and tractors. They had these big ass cows and oxen and bulls. Basically, they attached to them what's called a yoke. And uh, basically, they would use that yoke to pull, you know, like it, they would pull a plow, right, to plow the ground, or they would carry some type of equipment or whatever. But in order for these bulls to carry it, they had to put a yoke around their neck. So you could have two bulls of the same size with a yoke around their neck so that they can pull the weight equally. Make sense? So the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Basically, that's like having a bull and like a donkey trying to pull this weight. And we also understand just from our studies that it's not that simple, right? Because people are so attached. It's about attachment. So even still, you'll have this partner who may have cheated on you or whatever, whatever. That attachment factors in to where you can't let go. You'd, you'd rather sit there and fight it out. It's quite interesting because in relation to cheating, that's like one of the top 
you know, entertainment factors for media in today's societies, but like people just love that sort of drama. But yeah, you're right. It's definitely about attachment for sure. And, um, you know, people take it much more personally as well, um, to the point of where they start questioning, uh, whether they're at fault, um, in regards to that happening and then you know if you have childhood issues as well that goes even further you know for example again going back to episode one where we were talking about um uh, feeling you know unloved or undesired with your parents and then you're being disappointed by a future partner it's it's the same thing but i feel like when you break it down and you you know step aside and detach yourself you do see it from a completely different angle for sure because if we don't detach ourselves and we keep reacting emotionally then the cycle just continues we just pass it over to other people and other situations right and there we have it the cycle continuing as we've seen again from our studies this dimension that we live in is a dimension of patterns that replicate and this goes all the way down to the most minute atoms and the dna and the mitochondria which is the powerhouse of the cell all the way up to people and planets and Everything is, is, is repeating algorithms. So that would also include our mental patterns, emotional patterns. And if we don't solve these relationship mismatches, they literally repeat all of our lives, starting with our parents and all the way till if we solve them. Yeah. Or it's passed on to our children. There we go. Passed on to our children. And this is what some of the woo woo spooky people call generational curses. Yeah, it's not generational curses. It's more than like just ineffective parenting. Hmm. That's one way to look at it, right? Ineffective parenting. But we, we, you could only say that if there was such a thing as effective parenting. Is there a standard for effective parenting? There's not a one size that fits all, right? But I would say there are definitely more useful and more appropriate ways to parent yes there are definitely more efficient ways to do things which would again fall up under patterns there are more efficient patterns and there are inefficient patterns but you can only work on the patterns that are suited to you right so people that are in chaos people that have disarray in their lives they're not gonna you know buy a hypnosis or an NLP book and understand how to be a good parent they're gonna just you know maybe react with violence to the children or um be emotionally immature in some way we wouldn't even expect them to have that knowledge because it's not in their sphere of availability if you will it may be in ours because we study this and you know we've seen the results of it but for them like hell no mm-hmm so therefore, it goes back to that quote where it's like, was it that Jesus said? It's like, don't don't judge them because they, they don't even understand. They don't even know. <laughs> Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yeah, exactly. They, they can't help it. And that's why it's important to not judge. Yeah. Like I've been hearing in my consultations all day long, easier said than done. Yeah, but who said that? Do you know what I mean? It's like, what if you change your... Like, I've been doing that, and to be fair, it's been quite beneficial. Like, my mind will automatically be like, oh, it's, it's so hard to change yourself, or it's so hard to do this. And I was like, no, wait. What if we accept the belief that it's easy? What happens then? What's the harm in trying it out? Yes, ma'am. I agree with that. See, a lot of people say easier said than done. Like I said, that's what I've been hearing all day. But I don't... I try not to let them sit with that because that's a cop out. You know what I mean? That's a program as well. Like you, you're repeating that affirmation to yourself and you're automatically setting yourself up for failure. It's the same as saying that you're going to try instead of saying that you will do. Right. There's a big difference. If I said that I would try to lift heavy in the gym, I would probably fail because that mind to muscle connection wouldn't happen. But if I envision myself lifting heavy, I, I'm going to hit those goals. And I did. So it works. Hmm. Now you mentioned something earlier called the sphere of availability. Could you tell us what that means and where that comes from? Oh boy. Um, sphere of availability. The first time I was introduced to that concept was through 
who feels um, creative visualization. Yes. And basically, if you like, imagine yourself in space, right? Nothing else is blackness and your body, <clears throat> and you have like this ring around you. So, depending on the size of that ring, um, we're talking metaphorically, right? Not not quite literally, but de depending on the size and the magnetism of yourself, certain things pass through that ring, right? So, for example, um, you have a guy, right? And he wants to become rich, but he's poor as hell. It would be very, very rare, I suppose is the right term, to say that he would be able to go, you know, from rags to riches practically overnight and become a millionaire, you know, when you, you're homeless, as an example. So what you would start doing um, is gradually expanding your sphere, right? So, you know, the, the person would start by um, manifesting, you know, free food or, you know, a place to stay and then, you know, some items, some furnishing, some clothes, then, you know, a, a permanent property. And the sphere, like, gradually expands because at the same time, internally, you're gradually proving the concept to yourself right and you're able to like bring about more things it it's kind of all down to belief i mean realistically it could very well be possible that you know you could have a literal rags to riches overnight but it, it's all down to your personal belief and how you know how strong your self-concept is and how um magnetic you are in terms of um acquiring the things that you would like yeah that's basically right and another thing that i want to emphasize is that number one it's not just physical things that are being attracted um the sphere of availability honestly is mostly conceptual and like you said it's about self image and self-belief you can only do what you believe you can do what you believe you're capable of you're not even going to attempt things that you don't believe you're capable of and one of the best ways to increase confidence is to do things that, you know, you probably didn't realize you could do because that starts to expand your sphere of availability in the way that you show yourself that, yes, you are capable of, of things that you didn't think. So, like I said, with, uh, well, as I was saying earlier to someone I was working with, they're thinking about starting an online business and I'm really starting to get out of the habit of just dropping information on people because even if he wants to start an online business, there's a lot of things that I could say to him that would go in one ear out the other, right? Because he wouldn't have a context. So before dropping any type of knowledge, I like to get more information on what the person understands. So I asked him questions and, um, you know, just from what he's talking about, uh, he has a, a completely different image of what it would be like because he hasn't done it yet. So instead of dropping all this information he, that he doesn't have a sphere of availability to work with yet, I, I provided information that I think could be helpful for where he is at the time. And to him, that was pretty profound. So likewise, when it comes to the sphere of availability, it's a lot to do with information and concepts, right? So we're talking about being the bigger person. This has to do also with the sphere of availability. If you don't have the understanding of what's going on with the relationship dynamic then of course you're only going to be concerned about you being misinterpreted and understood and i want you to see it my way and that kind of thing yeah as i'm um listening to you talk about it i'm like slowly tripping myself out because realistically everything's a sphere of availability like you know if a woman gives birth she can't just drop a baby out like her cervix has to dilate first right or um, if you're selling something to somebody, you can't just go up to them and, and, you know, be like, hey, buy this. You have to, you know, slowly engage them, hypnotize them, tell them what you're about and do it that way. So it's like everything is a slow, well, it doesn't have to be slow, but it's like a gradual process that follows a certain pattern um, and then expands to the final outcome. But it's also quite interesting to me because... Um, you know, we sit here and we discuss like all these crazy things 
and even when we're not live like i'll message you something crazy and then you'll message me something crazy back but for you know for the rest of the world people are very much wrapped up in matter and emotions and you know the drama politics world issues and oh geez this is gonna be like you know potentially a very unpopular opinion based on today's standards but none of that stuff matters and just on the principle alone on you know what you focus on expands now whether that's good or bad but like there's there's a lot going on in the world right now um and it's like i'm exposed to it pretty much daily every time like i open social media but it's quite interesting to see that once you narrow it down because it's like a gigantic tree right with all these different branches and all these different agendas and you know people you know trying to get you to fight the good fight and once you narrow it down it really goes down to uh you know three categories if you will that the human race operates on and that's wealth health and love which is quite funny because when you you know when you think about it that way this is what modern exist well not even modern exist this is what existence runs on every time you see a marketing ad once you get past all the fancy language and the flashing images you can see what the intention is and what category that goes into health wealth and relationships the three main things that people care about Hmm. And and you know now that you mentioned that we've we're still talking about the sphere of availability, right? A person with a smaller sphere of availability, all they're concerned about is drama, politics, entertainment. My team's going to the Super Bowl. Yeah, but the thing is, people are so focused on the physical anyway, which you know I can totally understand because. The senses are super strong, especially your visual senses, and it's it's you know reality for a lot of people. So it kind of goes again to say if if the person isn't ready to hear the message, they're not going to. When the student is ready, the master appears. And you know, that doesn't just go for occult stuff. Like that's life in general. You can be a student of anything and anything can be a teacher of life. But when you're ready for that lesson, that's when you recognize the lesson. Because the thing is, the stuff is around us all the time. You know what I'm saying? Like there might be somebody in your life who's into something that you're going to get into, but you don't recognize them until you're finally ready to see that. The master doesn't go looking for students. I think the only person that does that is somebody who's trying to make some cash, right? Or start a cult. Or thirsty men on a night out, punching way above their weight. (laughs) A woman can get dick at any point in time. A man can't necessarily do that. Once he's ready though, right? Once he learns a few things about how it works. Yeah, but most like never really do. And I can't remember if it was um, an article or a statistic or something, but I remember reading um you know something and it said along the lines of you know the the kind of true quote-unquote desirable uh males they would never behave in um you know in such a way that the vast majority of men do whereas um the (laughs) the leftovers i don't know the the less desirable males they you know it's like it's almost like acting from desperation or something and it's uh it's a dynamic that i never truly understood but it's it's like props to you for having that much confidence you know where your sphere of availability is quite small but you're trying to expand it quite quickly (laughs) yeah I think for the most part, these type of men realize they have nothing to lose because they're working from the bottom up. Honestly, the old statistic was 80% of women sleep with 20% of the men. I think that might need to be redone to uh, 100% of the women seek 20% of the men. 
Because, you know, every women want the best man they can get. Like, nobody really wants that, that leftover type guy you just described. <laughs> I mean, of course, like, I know for myself and probably for the vast majority of women, it's very important to, like, have that inner knowing of safety and security. Because um, otherwise, like, stuff stuff like kids and like marriage um and a future isn't even really on your mind because it's it's just very important to feel um secure you know and that the the male um, energy that's in your life is not chaotic and unstable but um protective and um nourishing in a way and and refined right otherwise like of, of course you know nobody really wants the uh the, the leftovers <laughs> uh you know somebody that that goes out and like blows all their money or has no stability um and just chaos in their life like of course but you're talking about once you're in the relationship i'm talking about before you even get that far so if we're talking about before the relationship do you believe in love at first sight no i do not i mean let's be real with like okay so i already know just by talking about this love at first sight some people are attached to that idea so they're going to stop listening right now and that's fine you know live your life but when you really break that down and think about it it's not very possible what are you in love with the face and the body that you just saw like what else is there to be to love would you say that perhaps they're like you know unconsciously or subconsciously picking up on certain no. patterns um or you know that whole sort of concept about um soulmates hell no fuck that soulmate stuff again if that's what you believe i'm not saying fuck you personally do your thing like if you if it works for you let it work but based on what i understand in my life that, that doesn't add up, right? Because you talk about reading the energy. Well, what, what's being read? Like I mentioned, there's a criteria that has to be checked off. And if you do feel a certain special kind of way after seeing somebody, right? They have visually checked off that criteria, but there's more, right? There's mental criteria, there's emotional, there's history, there's compatibility. There's all kind of things that are being ignored. And I think that that love at first sight stuff stems from a type of uh, emotional immaturity that comes from some childhood stuff that hasn't been resolved. The verdict is out. Interesting. Um, but it's also, you know, quite fascinating because you see certain people who, you know, are quote unquote very shallow when they have certain, you know, standards in terms of physicality for, you know, what they expect in a partner. But what I've observed you know recently is that that can be so easily overwritten um just by hitting the emotional criteria right right. to the point of where like we know society can be quite harsh in terms of beauty standards and whatnot but if you know um you know how to work a person If you know what exactly it is that, you know, they're missing or they're lacking and you can provide that, you will instantly become the most attractive person. And that's why I was continuing the saying criteria. Hopefully those who are perceptive can pick up. But I know that many people need things to be direct. So since you're taking it there, when I say this, when I say that there's a checklist and a criteria, if you think about that long enough and that means that if you could figure out what that criteria is it could be hijacked and that's part of what our podcast is about right the limitless mind which i wanted to call mind hackers but paulina thought that was lame so what you did not just expose me like that what the heck (laughs) i mean it is lame it sounds like a freaking here we go primary school science project science project this is a science project thank you very much yeah that may be so but you know it's a a polished professional science project still a science project okay whatever um please inform us Mm -hmm. how somebody would go about um hacking such a process well it's all about that criteria right it's all about seeing what that list would be 
And the first question you'd probably ask is, well, everyone's different. Everyone has a different list. Well, that's that's kind of true and also not kind of true. If you really study the human mind, there's only so many responses and criteria to be met. How many emotions are there? There's like six, maybe. We think that we're so dynamic and so versatile and just so different and unique. Now, that, that's all ego right there. The truth is we're incredibly simple animals, incredibly simple animals. And we, we romanticize the concept of a human being. But the truth is we're very predictable and we're very easy to manipulate. So if a person were to figure out what traditionally an individual would need to make them happy, if you could find that criteria, then you could really do whatever you want with whoever you want. Where would someone start to do this? A good place to start would be study. I would even say study of self. What is it that you require to fall in love with somebody? What is love, right? What is the checklist for love? What, how do you know that you are in love? Find that checklist and then find uh, how, how do you know that a person is suitable for love? Do we just go in a full circle of um, what we um, believe about ourselves reflects in others and, you know, the whole people are projecting, blah, blah, blah. Down. We have a tendency to do that, huh? It's, just, it's not even that. It's reality, man. It's unavoidable. It's patterns. Like, I don't know how people can't see how everything is connected. Everything. It's because they're still sleeping. But that's why we're here to help them wake up. So if you're somebody who happens to be one of those leftovers that Polina had mentioned, like maybe you saw her in the gym and <laughs> you tried to shoot your shot and it didn't work. The audacity. Maybe you need to start... <laughs> analyzing your uh leftovers. your criteria look i i never liked leftovers man i always <laughs> ended up putting them in the bin i i like fresh food okay is that such a crime now here's what i'm suggesting i'm suggesting that those, those leftovers crawl out of the trash can and start studying put yourself in that microwave and then try again but this time if you figure out that criteria, maybe you won't maybe you won't be able to shoot your shot with the same person, but you can try again, right? Because like like what you said, uh, Apollo, there is uh, abundance, right? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, you you learn your lesson, and um, you definitely grow as a person. But that's not to say that you can't shoot your shot with you know the exact same person. You totally can, especially if we're going by. Um, you know, quantum physics and that concept of everything is you pushed out and there's a, you know, a microcosm for every consciousness and objects can simultaneously exist um, across all dimensions. Um, there really truly is nothing stopping you except the own limitations that you place upon yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, there's a chance you can uh, connect with the girl who rejected you the first time, you fellas, and then you can have your revenge. Revenge? I mean, you can then prove to yourself that anything is possible. <laughs> Ooh. I think you got I'm some kidding. shadow work to do. I'm kidding. No He's revenge not. in me. Oh, really? Mm hmm. I beg to differ. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Because the thing is, when you dwell on these things, they now become a part of your personality, they become a part of your algorithm, your pattern. Can you imagine being angry all the time? Or the sphere of availability changes. That's another good point. You change your sphere of availability. Because they have this thing that you know about so well called the reticular activation system, right? Do I? <laughs> Could you tell us what that is? A reticular activation system is... Um, geez, it's basically a part of your mind that brings forward um, anything that you're consistently thinking about. So as we mentioned in you know one of the first episodes, if you have a desire to get mm. a certain car mm. um, and you know you really dwell on that desire and, and you're consistently thinking about it, you will start to pay attention to that car in real life. And this is what's known as synchronicities, right? So you'll be out you know, doing whatever it is that you're doing and, you know, your dream car goes by and you're like, oh, wow, that, that's so cool. You know, I just thought about that. And, you know, a lot of people take it as a 
uh, you know, spooky coincidence. Um, but it, it's really just your mind seeking out the patterns and paying attention to what it is, you know, that you're interested in, whether that's good or bad, it will find, you know, those things in your daily life. Yeah, that's a pretty cool concept. So you're saying that what you focus on expands, like you're literally saying that. Yeah, it's, it's science at this point that what you focus on expands and what you focus on exists, right? It's like, like I said, like I see reality as a video game now. And, you know, if you're playing a game, you can only see what's around you. The other map and the other characters haven't loaded yet. So it's quite literally, you know, as above, so below, as within, so without. What you focus on expands. Everything is you pushed out. When the student is ready, the master appears, right? We could squeeze that in there too. Yeah, you can also, you know, squeeze in all the negative aspects of life because we, you know, we, we've had experience with somebody or maybe we were that person who, um, you know, was always seeing the worst in people or in situations. And, um, you know, that that's all you're ever going to see around in your environment because, like I said before, reality is a mirror. And I mean, I went through that as well because, like, <laughs> I've done my fair share of retail and customer service, and in particular, like in in those two categories, like you do really work with like the worst of the worst. Like people are so entitled and so rude. Um, it, it's wild. Like people will complain like just because like you did you didn't smile or something, and that offended them. Um, so for me, it's like when, when that was just my entire experience with, you know, my co-workers, mainly managers and the general public, I was like, whoa, like humanity really, really sucks. Like people, people are assholes and like there's, there's no need for this behavior whatsoever. But, you know, as my experience went on um, in these sections, and that's all I saw. And I kind of like adopted this belief um, that, yeah, people are assholes. People are very entitled. People are selfish. And, you know, it's better to, to be alone and to um, stay away from everyone because they're only going to like, you know, be dicks or, you know, they're going to hurt you in some way. Um, and of course, like that's all I ever saw because that's what I was focused on. And I adopted that belief. It's also because everyone is so sensory based and everyone is so focused on what's around them. They completely fail to, you know, even phantom deeper concepts to what reality truly is. But, you know, at the end of the day, even if you're a skeptic, that's cool. Because like at heart, I'm still also a skeptic. I still question um, all of my beliefs every single day. But the point is you really truly lose nothing just by thinking positively, right? Because, you know, even if none of this is real and it means absolutely nothing to you, you will automatically just put yourself in a better mood just by trying to see the best, you know, in every person, in every situation um, and trying to shift your mentality that way. It makes life a lot easier um, when you have such a mentality compared to always seeing the worst and you know the most evil um and the most disgusting and absolutely everything well put hmm interesting interesting so we kind of went in a few different directions but we find that it all connects and it has to do with awareness of potentiality or in other words your, your sphere of availability you can't be the bigger person unless you are aware of more options, right? Okay, so we could certainly go on for a very long time, but I think that uh, to keep it fair for our listeners and also to tease them so that they'll tune in next time as if they had a choice, because this is such an addictive podcast, I would listen to it over and over and over again. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up here today. And if you are leftovers, hit that microwave. Give yourself a second chance. <laughs> oh, man, we need to make some merch, like microwave <laughs> leftovers or something. Microwave leftovers. I've been leftovers before. It's not fun at the time. 
but then you learn. That's life. Yeah. Pain is a great teacher. It can be. Love is a good teacher, too. I mean, yeah. I've been a leftover, too. It was um, an enlightening experience, for sure. I learned a lot. <laughs> what? I can't believe that. You? Yeah, we just you just have to learn how to, um, you know, get your lesson out of the situation and then move on, because being stuck in that is really shitty. Like, you really want to get out of that as soon as possible. Yeah, and I wouldn't want anybody to stay there. So learn. Yeah, we like what you said earlier, the three main things that we care about is health, wealth, and relationships. So if you're somebody who's not having much success in your relationships, you find yourself left over and left out, then maybe start learning that criteria of what makes people fall in love. So tune in next time. Hope that this has been useful and appropriate, helpful for you. Enjoy your day, your evening, and here's to having a limitless mind.